So this this is your this special. What's cool about it is more. It's kind of almost more of a documentary, and it's so much different than all the specials that are out now. First of all, it's funny. Hey, hey. and uh, <laughs> secondly, it's just so cool because nobody captures behind the scenes uh, and the comedy comedian mind like like old Quinn here. Yeah, I mean, I like I. I mean, like I've said before, I would love nothing better than if we could do that as a weekly thing with all the comedians, you know what I mean? And just every oh. comedian, because when you think about comedians, it is, it is, it's always the take you have on something that makes it so interesting to me, you know? Yes. Like, um, yes. like anytime you ask a comedian a question, not anytime, but most of the time, they won't give you the common wisdom. They'll give you their own angle on things. And you're like, wow, that's why I love to be around comedians. You know? Right. It's not yeah. It's all about yeah, the angle. Because, yeah, the angle, exactly. And that's what I feel like uh, that would be fun to do that every week, you know? Yeah, and we'd probably get more more realistic. Because, you know, we have to, like, really craft the joke and kind of have a structure and a setup and a punchline. But if you really just got to the backstage and the hang, it's almost like a podcast. Yeah. You could really get to the meat of it. Well, well, I don't want to hold myself to that high expectation. But listen, <laughs> almost a podcast, you say. Um, no, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it's a combination podcast. I mean, that's the funny thing about, uh, standup is all the talk in the world, but then you're, oh no, I got to go on. And suddenly right. all my philosophies go out the window. Yeah. You know, because it's like, right. So you get this crowd and they're not, they don't care that you figured it out. They think you didn't figure it out for them. And then you're like, ah, and all the audibles you have to throw. It's really, you know. It's really good in that way. It's like going from coaching to suddenly playing in the game in the middle of your life every day. And that's what keeps you honest. It keeps you sure. humble. It keeps you honest. Because you're like, oh, my God, i got to do this still, you know, instead of just talking comedy, which we love. But then how many, how many times have you been at a gig with some guy who's like, you know, comedy is this, and you're like, this guy really gets it. He had yeah, these hacks. Like, I love this guy. Then he goes on stage, the biggest hack you ever saw in your life. <laughs> yeah, because... Because hack works, it gets laughs, and you don't want to die up but there. But backstage, just... he's, backstage, he's missed a philosophy. Yeah, of course, like, of course. Telling you, and you're like, this guy's really gets. He, he's cool. I like the guy. Right. Like, yeah, you know, it's just. And I, I remember in the '80s, I was at a, I was at a, we used to do the one nineties in Jersey every night. You know, I was with uh, this act. You know, who remained nameless. He's probably dead anyway. But he starts talking to me. I never met him before. He starts riffing in the backseat of the car. I go, this guy's the funniest person. We're driving through Jersey. He's riffing. I'm going, this guy's like a comedic genius. Yeah. I can't believe he's, he's going to be this. Then he goes on stage. That was his act. He just did his <laughs> act. Oh, that's, that's crazy. What a psycho. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but don't you feel like, I feel like stand-up makes you at least 30% less funny than you actually are. Because you can be the funniest guy in the world, but when you go on that stage, it has to be accessible to this crowd of strangers that doesn't know you. So you have to, like, set the table, let them know who you are, where you're coming from, and then it's almost like food where you have to set up a plate in a certain way so people will eat it. You have to put more sugar, more salt, more grease, and it makes you yeah. funny. Well, I mean, you mean, do you mean it makes you less funny over time as, an, as a human being? Or you mean oh, it's less funny in the than you are off stage? Yeah, because you have to cater to them so much that it makes you have to structure and change this and change that. But if, if it was just backstage and a camera was on you and you didn't know the camera was on you, you're way funnier. Yes. I, I Well, I mean, that's definitely what I was going for with Tough Crowd and with this thing, you know, which is trying to capture that other side, that, you know, m that merciless, you know, back and forth kind of, you know, banter that we have when you go, oh, my God, these people are so funny. I'm t I've always been trying to uh, steer something towards that, right? Right, yeah, and you, you nailed it. You nailed it in the, uh, the new HBO Max. Uh, of course. That's what, also, so good. thanks. But also, remember something. Everybody is funnier than they are. Like, if you see a group of waiters getting ready to sort of shift, Back, they start talking about the, the shift they're about to, the manager, the customers, all the problems. You'll laugh like crazy if you're a waiter. Of because course. It's funny. 
Yeah. So with us, it's supposed to, our whole business is being funny. It should be even more exponentially funny, you know? I agree. I agree. But just like a waiter, when you're back in the back kitchen, you're, you're fucking around with all the other guys. It's hilarious. But then you have to put on that waiter face, tuck your shirt in, and, and say, how you doing, Mr. Johnson? What can I get you? And that's the same with stand-up, where, especially for me, a guy who's not famous, he's still, every game is an away game. you got to bring it. Well, yes. But at the same time, the, um, the, what, 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 what you're trying, the reason that you, for, we'll take that HBO Max as an example, the reason bombing is so, uh, such an obsession is not because it's our biggest fear, because it's not our biggest fear. We've all bombed so many times. It can't be our sure. biggest fear. We're not psychotic. But it's also because uh, it brings out a side of spontaneity. Aside immediacy, like we yeah. are like suddenly like in the moment, and it's so funny to us because there's no way to face. The way to just drop the tray of drink. Right. So now right. all that facade is gone. <laughs> yes, and that's the, that's, what, that's the beauty that's of bombing. Yeah, the, yes. Well, that you said, it, you said it perfectly in the special when when after a comic goes up. That's when they're the funniest because they get off stage, they got that adrenaline still going, and they're riffing and rapping, and, and it's all, yes. all the pressure's off. Yes, exactly. It's so true. And, and all the facade is gone. You know what I mean? Yes. Like you, people don't realize. Like somebody talks to you before you go on. Some comedians do it. I, I hate when people like yapping in my ear. I'm about to go on and say, give me at least 30 seconds. To I prepare. know. It's still a show. It's still, yeah. so, people still pay money to see the goddamn thing. Would you please stop, you know? I know, I know. I'm not this weirdo. I hate these savant douchebag, like, you know, they don't give a shit. They go on stage, they go, what do, what do I want to talk about? Like, no, I'd li- I got I gotta set. I'd like to prepare. I'd like to be mentally ready. Yeah. Let me, yeah, I hate that. My, my me opener, too. this me did that. Um, oh, God, that's even worse. It's even worse. I know. <laughs> yeah, let me get to my bike you know, I, I always... What's that? He's like, oh, yeah, so let me like try advice to... real quick. Yes. <laughs> oh, you said, they're saying that right before you go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a nightmare. Like, so, uh, <laughs> how long before you get a manager? I'm like, ah, they're calling my name, you psycho. It's like, not only that, you idiot, you're doing 20. Doing 20 <laughs> and doing an hour is two different things because doing 20 is hard. Yeah. But if you bomb... Nobody asks for their money back. Right. If I bomb, <laughs> I don't get paid. You don't get paid. The club, it, it ruins the whole thing. You understand the difference? You know? So true, yeah. Kind of story, you know? Right, right. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, the the other, that's the other graduation. It's from being the middle that kills, which is hard. I'm not saying it's that easy. But being a middle that kills and a headliner that does well is two different jobs, two different realities. Yeah. Yeah, you know? that's meant to be a And when I was in the middle, I was that asshole, too. Yeah, yeah. When I was in the dick, it was like, oh, I blew that guy off the stage. It's like, that's not your job, and it's not that hard to blow somebody who's trying to do their job off the stage, idiot, you know? I know, and they're not as drunk yet. They're not as tired. You don't have checks. You don't have to fill the room. You don't have to be the in charge of the numbers, you know? Like, it, it, yeah. it's a key gig. Have, and you don't have to have that rhythm. People don't yes. realize there's this... In the middle of your set, at 30, 35 minutes, uh, the yeah. rhythm changes in the room. That's just yes. how it is. Totally. Because it's totally. energy. It's life. It's just, that's how energy in a room changes when someone's talking for a long time. So now, right. you've got to be in a, you've got to read whatever the rhythm is and just be with it, you know? Yeah. You know? And yeah, that's yeah, it. exactly. As, as Seinfeld says, you've got to learn how to sustain and pace. Whereas the other guy can just yeah. go on from zero to 60 for 20 minutes. Yeah, you can do seven tricks. Those right. tricks are not going to work as well in most headline gigs. It's a complete idiot, you know. But I'm saying, uh, yeah. Um, do you think, do, can we ever get rid of the check spot? It's 2020. Uh, it feels like that's, that's so archaic. Like, we got computers, we got iPads. What the hell are we doing with these checks? Uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of my racial mm-hmm. jump, which is already a tightrope walk, and then you're going to drop a, right. a, a check on a guy? I'm like, this is brutal. Judah Freelander tried this in the early 2000s. I remember this. Yes, and we barely, we were all like, yeah, Judah, do it. But 
we didn't make a national. There wasn't a national unity on this, even though right. agreed with it. everybody agreed. But whatever combination of laziness and self-obsession, but people were like, yeah, you would do that. It's great, and that was it. <laughs> and it just kind of floated away. It dis- dissipates. Ah, damn, it's brutal. Um, yeah. So, no, so heard that. Is it fun? Uh, not fun, but is it, is it kind of a relief writing? Is, is this your second book? Yeah. Came out. Yeah. Is it? You know, you don't have to worry about laughs. You don't have to worry. I mean, I know you work it out on stage still, which we all appreciate. But you can just yeah. type freely and let it flow. There's no, no nothing holding you back. No, it, it's it's definitely. It's like I said. It's the first half of what we were talking about before. It's the theoretical stuff. You know, uh-huh. and then people are like that's not funny. The two people tell me it's not funny, and then I rewrite it. It's not a bunch of people booing and going. Uh-huh. I had a bad night because of this guy. We right. had, our, you know, our anniversary yeah. was ruined. This guy's not. It's just a couple. Of, yeah. So it's. A, I mean, that's the beauty. The horror stand up is that, but the beauty of it is that too, because you're not going to fool yourself into being a mildly amusing person who thinks they're funny. Right. You know what I mean. Yeah, you're not totally. going to go through life being like, I'm very, I'm very funny. And then people are like, you know, that guy's kind of funny. You know, <laughs> you're not, you're not, and it's the other problem with doing gigs that are too, if you're just doing what you just call the alternative channel, I don't know what you would call it now, it gets very parochial because yes. you're only, you're playing to a bunch of kids that were the same college as you and like the same ironic movie. So yeah, you'll get laughs, you can kill. But, then you go out into a, uh, a comedy world, a world, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where the crowds from, you know, five, five different, you know, ethnic, socioeconomic groups, and you mm-hmm. can't hang, you know? Yeah, yeah, but no can't hang with the big no, boys because yeah. There's no bachelorette party though at your at your keyboard though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you yeah. can you can just rip and go and go and and maybe it makes you go into new places with, with stand up. You're so walled in, like all right, I, I haven't gotten a laugh. Well, that's minutes, so. that's why alternative comedy started because stand up got to be. I was around for the whole thing, you know? and yeah. stand up got to be so uh, simple and simple minded and kind of hacky in that sense of like, hey, I'm just working for everybody that the alternative scene sprung out of people going, wait a minute, I want a little time to go about other stuff in different ways. Yeah. You know, but then like anything else, it, it becomes a victim of its own success and its own, you know, believing your own ability. So, I mean, right. But yeah, it's sort of for all the right reasons, like anything, you know, and, um, yeah, that's how it is. And that's, uh, yeah, but it was based on the fact that, right, that Santa got too confined to you went up, and you killed, and you kept this cadence, and you spoke in this subject, and you went in this direction, and so it was almost like this robotic thing that had yeah. to be fought against. So, right. Yeah. yeah, it's a great. I never thought of it that way. And I loved all yeah. comedy when I started. I, I that's kind of where I went. I went in that scene because I liked David Cross yeah. and all that shit growing up. Yeah. No, well, that stuff is. I, it was there for a good reason, you know. Right. Right. But like it, anything it else, on. things get you know, things become yeah. corrupted by whatever combination, and it becomes like okay, now we're you know we you do, suddenly it became a thing where anybody outside of my thing is hacked, and it's like no, you don't understand, you know? Right, I mean? right, yeah. You know, you I, can't just decide, to, yeah, because then suddenly from the good people doing alternative comp, you have people that are excusing their own lack of talent to just attack other comedy, you know? Yes. You know, and how yes. many people I've known over the years, just idiots that come up to me and go, that person's hacked. And I'm like, you don't understand comedy at all if you think that's a hack. Yes. You know? I know that word was getting thrown around. It, that word gets thrown around like the word racist now. Like, it used to mean that's something, right. but now it's just too, too willy-nilly. Yeah, now it's just thrown around too, too often. Yeah, yeah, I feel like woke comedy is starting to kind of go the way of, of what all, you know, at first, yeah, it was good. We're saying fag every three words. I get it. You know, it hurts people's feelings. Right, so, hey, right. let's dial back. But now it's like, Absolutely. hey, uh, Aziz had a bad date, but threw in his life. Yeah, well, let's, now you're talking about two different things. You're talking oh. about, 
Oh, wait. Oh, Roseanne. <laughs> Roseanne had a tweet about monkeys, and it, it, now her life is ruined because of a tweet a comedian <laughs> made. Right. But I'm saying, uh, yeah, I'm just saying that com- if we're talking about stand-up comedy, yeah, uh, woke comedy, right, it, it started exactly the same way, right? It became this thing that that was like, oh, yeah, everybody's just getting lazy, you know? Right. And then suddenly it became, it's lazy, you know? And yeah. it's based on, you know, it's based on, it's almost based on reacting to other comedy. So if you're based yeah. in... If you're basing an art on critiquing other people's art, like what happened in the art world, where suddenly it became ironic and just commenting on other art. Yeah, you know, so the true. literal art. So then suddenly you're like, well, wait a minute, how is that valid? As a, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's not the blank page that they always yes. talk about how hard it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you. When the, I, it's weird because I'm more scared of other comics now than I am of the soccer moms or the the real Christian like, <laughs> God fearing guy, which is a new thing. Yeah. I used to be like, oh shit, this this religious guy is gonna hate this bit. Now I'm like, oh, this L.A. lady is gonna <laughs> trash on Twitter. I'm like, wait, you're a comic, you idiot. Why are you yelling at me? <laughs> ah, but that's yeah. Well, that's the way everything becomes. You know what I mean? That's he, that's why uh, George Orwell was so brilliant. Because yeah, he was yeah. like, oh yeah, you become what you hate most, and it's such a right. cliche. I mean, you know. I yeah, thought he was the yeah. first one to think of it, but I'm just saying the, um, you know, yeah, so many people become like, wait a minute, this is the problem. It's like, that's why I always say, when, whenever anybody interviews me, I go, don't quit punching. I'm not, there's no punching down in comedy. It's play mm-hmm. fighting. Stop only punching. I like you that. Know? Because only yeah, punching up or punching down already, you, you're misidentifying what stand-up comedy is, in my opinion. Yes, yes. Well said. Well, that's a great little yeah. nugget. Yeah. Uh, it, but here's the thing is uh, when it all kind of changes and goes back to whatever normalness, I won't be forgetting all those those uh, douches who went to the other side. Um, well, well, you know, what, what, know. you're saying that like, what, what are you going to do? Hunt them down. <laughs> no, when they say, hey, can I get on your show or whatever. You're just going to give them, you're just going to go, you son of, what are you going to do, yell at them in a bar? Come on. Um, <laughs> no, when they when they say, should we have this guy on the show? I'm going to go, fuck that. <laughs> That's about it. Hey, go <laughs> talk, God damn it. I know. But, you, you know, the, uh, <laughs> well, you don't want to be, you don't, don't want to be guilty of what they're doing either. You know what I mean? No, you're right. Like, I mean, you're right. The, and, and the fact of the matter is, like I said, and that'll get corrupted. You know, this is what happens. It goes back and forth. You know, there's nothing you do about this stuff. It's, it makes me, believe me, I'm, I'm like you. I'm sick of it. it makes, it's so dumb. And pretending to be so smart, it infuriates me. It brings my head explodes. Yeah, you same, know? same. But I mean, I, uh, I should just yeah, ignore it. Way, so I, I, I feed into it. I'm, I'm an idiot. Well, it's hard to ignore when it's your life. It's, I am saying, you know. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll move on. Maybe we can, can we take that Aziz thing out for the uh, the record. All right, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I got angry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you see the Bill, You see that Bill Maher thing that just is going viral? No. Oh, I got to send you the clip. It's fucking amazing. He just calls everybody out. He's like, "Stop canceling people. What the hell are you doing? These are human beings." It's it's, it's he puts up a picture of Louis and and Kevin Hart, and it's fucking great. But all right, moving on. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, sad times, you know, pandemic. We've lost already basically two comedy clubs. Uh, Dangerfield is done, which I know Dangerfield is like a punchline, but I fucking love that room. Well, it was the great thing about Dangerfield, I mean, it might be the only great thing about Dangerfield, is it was like, you know, when you were a little kid and you're like, I want to learn to swim. You can go, here's a swimming lesson. Other people go, we're throwing you in the lake, and we'll be back in 30 minutes. <laughs> Where are we gonna help you? And you either learn to swim or you don't, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, that yeah, they the leave you up there for 20 minutes with they're a piano. They're up there, and you better become a comedian if you're not one. You got that right. That's the beauty of it, right? I mean, how much, did that, yeah. how much did that teach you, you know, where you're like, oh, oh yeah, this is a survival game. 
Yeah, completely. Especially a, a queef like me. I'm coming out of Brooklyn, you know, at some uh, bar show, and I'm, I'm precious right, and right. cute. And then you go in there, and it's a virgin tunnel, and you know, Mickey yeah. from Long Island, and some lady with a big yeah. hair and huge cleavage. And yeah. you got you got to figure it out. You got to figure it out. That's the beauty of people never understood about danger fields. Those thirty minute spots, you got to figure it out. Oh yeah, they're not there, like you said. They're not there. To, there's no indulgence, you know. And that's, yeah. that's the beauty of those. I mean, that was the beauty of coming up in the Jersey rooms for us, too, you know? They would shove right. us into those Jersey rooms every night a one-nighter, and there were guys that were killed in the city and bomb in Jersey. And either they figured right. out or they stopped doing it because, you know, there's many kinds of comedy, and it's good to be, it's good to be a dad. It's good to understand that unless you want to be a niche, like I guess that parochial person, you want to be able to say, hey, put me in there right now. And, uh, you know, it just as a matter yeah. of pride. But when you go to any type of gig, you still might bomb sometimes, but it won't be for lack of awareness on, you know, on what you need to bring to that place, you know? Yes, yes. you got to be uh, well-rounded. It's almost like I heard a review once of Tom Petty. who said he's the blue jeans of comedy, I mean, of, of music. And I thought, like, that's <laughs> kind of what you have to be like in comedy if you do all these rooms. You go to Brooklyn, then you go to Jersey, then you go to Long Island. You gotta be a little. You gotta be Tom Petty. You gotta be uh, acceptable. And and people don't. I don't want people to mistake what you're saying. We're not saying you change your act. We're right. saying that the ultimate victory is to be able to have people in five different places laugh at what you wrote and what you think is fun. Yes. Yes. So it's not. Exactly. It's about energy, and it's about getting your point across you know, to different groups. It's not about changing your words or your point. It's people right. take this and go, oh, so you're saying adapt your, your material. No, no. We're not no. talking about that at all. We're talking about an energy thing. We're talking about being able to say, here's my idea of what's funny. It's, it's more in agree because you're not, you're not avoiding people. You're doing your act everywhere. Yes. But you're just changing. You're changing the way that the energy that you've got to bring to say what you want to say and what you think is fun, you know? Right, right, yeah. Perfect. Well said. It's, it's like some guys are great boxers, some guys are great wrestlers, but the UFC guy has got a little everything. And I feel like it's a comic right. you want to almost be UFC. Yeah, yeah. You're still fighting. You're still doing, you're still fighting the way you fight. You're not yes. going to say, oh, I'm going to please, because people will take this and go, oh, you're trying to please uh, you know, whoever you're around, like, no, nobody's changing, any, nobody's changing anything. If anything, pandering is when you only play the people that you know uh, uh, go along yeah. with what you're saying. That's pandering. Here, here, yeah. so true. It, it's so weird when these, these people interview you and they go, oh, I see you're doing Phoenix, then you're going up to Buffalo, and then you're going down to Houston, do you change your act? I'm like, how many acts do you think I have? <laughs> I just do my act. <laughs> like I got 17 hours of material based on the, the region. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, ooh, it's hot. They're like, fuck you. And you're like, oh, where are we? Buffalo. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it's right. But it's right. Somehow people, people reinterpret, you know, so that if you're, you know, if you, if you make your point, if you know how to look at a certain room and, and bring a different energy, you're not changing your intent or your jokes or your point of view, you know. And somebody yeah. twists that suddenly, that's the, you know, I've seen yeah. pandering a thousand times. And it doesn't look like when you're getting laughs. You, right. you know what I mean? Right. Totally. It's when you're getting, yay! You're getting yeah. Cheers. That's right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's so funny. I used to do the UCB rooms back when that was going on. And, like, I would see these right. stellar comics, and they would show up with, like, a, a book. And they'd be like, let me read a funny passage from this book. Isn't this weird? They have props and stuff. Like, you're a killer comic. You see your act. What do you, what do you, yeah. you it's, they thought like, oh, I'm going to do this weird show, so I'll, I'll be kitschy and different. Yeah, that's horrible. Horrible. I'm, I guarantee yeah. it barely works because yeah. you know, it's too, you're trying too hard to be, you know what I mean? Yeah, completely. It's like when the white guy goes into the black room and tries to be black. Like, no, just be right. your nerdy self. That would be actually more interesting. It's a novelty. Yes. Yeah, they have black acts. They don't want to see right. a black They don't need to see you doing a black act. They want to see a white yeah. guy being himself, being a white guy. No, oh, yeah. Right. Um, so do you, 
how much comedy are you consuming? Because you, you, you're pretty uh, on the pulse with everything. I mentioned this last yeah, time. I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been, like I said, I've been very bad lately because I've been writing, um, I've been writing a lot of wrongs. You know, I've been writing, uh, <laughs> you know, all this other stuff that I want to work on because, you know, because there's no stand-up. Although that new thing that came out with today, uh, some company came out and says 95% is effective, you know. So this will be right. good. We're yeah. ending. Yeah. And, so, and um, but um, yeah, but I mean, I I love doing that other stuff only because I feel like, like if I could do, you know, shows, if I could just be a producer, like you know, I've been doing stand up for a long time. If I could be a guy that just worked with stand ups, like even that special, I tried to get out of performing in that special. You know, I tried oh, to get really? out of it. Yeah, I was like, I don't want to perform. And then I don't know why I was thinking they would let me. Then like two weeks before. I was like, yeah, so I'm not performing. My manager's like, no, you're performing. And uh, I was like, oh, God, I just wanted to do it behind the camera and see, see how it feels. You know, like, like that's interesting to me now. This is what happened, yeah. you know. I'm more interested in you guys and your journey and what you guys are doing. Like, that's, right. my, that's interesting to me. And I feel like you need somebody like me to be able to really capture what you guys yeah. are doing or what you're thinking. Like, you can't have somebody outside of the game. You have to be right. somebody who's was in the game, but he's now doesn't want to be in it and she's retired. I mean, not retired, but out of that, out of that thing, but knows well enough to know the tricks and who's doing it right and who's playing games and who's, who's, you know, pandering and all that stuff. You know? Right. That's my, right. You know, I would love to just be like, you know, that's the song of, of comic shows. Yeah. Well, you gotta be Belichick and go on the Patriots. I mean, that's insane. That's a weird spot. Exactly. Also, how, how funny for people at home to be like, wait, he didn't want to perform? Well, what? He's a comedian. It's a special. Why wouldn't he want to go on? That's why comedians are so right. complex. That's, that's a hilarious thought. I don't want to go on. I just want to be in the back. Right. I mean, it, it, it takes, you have to do it for a thousand years before you feel that way, you know? <laughs> and like, now I'm like, oh, God. I mean, I always want to go on. You know, but that's why comedians, that's what you need to be a comedian. You need to be, in my opinion, you know, Everybody has their own little opinions on this stuff. But to me, you need to be the perfect... Like, when I was at Catch a Rising Star, we all start now. It's the mid-80s, right? Mm -hmm. So comedy's relatively new. Let's say Rodney Dangerfield. I remember one night, like, Rodney Dangerfield went on. Oh, wow. And David, David Renner or somebody like that and some, some other act who was pretty big who killed. And then there's, like, six of us. They were, like, the backups. They used to have backups in comedy. Okay, so mm -hmm. And it was late in the show, there was no other regular ass, you know, who wants to go on? And we all we'll raise our hand, like, I'll go on. Because you need to have that in comedy. The biggest act in the country, you got 20 minutes of mediocre shit, and you're like, yeah, I could do it. Like, you need to have <laughs> that personality. Like, I'm as funny as anything you, these people just saw. I'll kill, too. Totally. That's the you know, really is key. Yeah, you to, to last. You have to be like, right. yeah, fuck yeah. Right. <laughs> and you see many people that just think they never leave. You know? But yeah. as we both know, the key is if you're, if you're writing, if you're not writing, you're going to fade away. Because I've seen some of the funniest, I mean, believe me, in the 80s, there were great, great, great comics all over the place. Funny, yeah. funny people. Really funny. Uh -huh. And they stopped writing because in yeah. those days you didn't think unless you were a certain type, you know what I mean? You weren't even thinking like, I need more material. You know what I mean? You're like, hey, I have right. power. And yeah. these guys just faded away because you were in it, their energy changed. Yeah. Even if that material still held up, they changed. They, they were just deflated. And yeah, so that's the point. real reason to keep writing. Yeah. Totally. Great point. Yeah. Uh, remember Ronnie Shakes? I used to love that guy. Oh, my God. We were just talking about him. So, really? So hilarious. Hilarious, yeah. brilliant, like philosophical, but he almost Woody Allen-esque, but then with a great turn at the end, and he had a good look. Man, he was he was great. That, that's sad that he's not around. I mean, yeah, no, he died. I was I, I knew he well. And he, had, he went on the road. I think he was in Akron at a comedy club, and he went jogging and died of a heart attack right there. And Wow. You know, middle of his career, just doing a weekend, you know, went for a jog and a heart attack. And he was so funny, but he's another great example I'm going to bring him up early, but I didn't want to go too obscure to you, but now you brought him up. First of all, some guy just put a compilation of him on YouTube. Oh, I didn't know that. Alice, he's just on there. 
Yeah, look at it. And uh, his, uh, he's a perfect example of a guy that people from the outside. I remember one friend of mine going to me that, hey, that guy's kind of an old school hacky guy. I go, no, he's not. He's uh, not hacky. He's in the 80s. I said, uh, it's just the opposite. He's ironically doing that one line of cadence, but yeah. he's telling you brilliant things and he's doing a certain, but it's sort of like a joke with it. With, not everybody understood what he was doing. It seemed like a Jackie Green type thing. It seemed like a Henny Onion style. But he was yeah. making fun of it while he was doing it too. And exactly. if you remember this joke, he goes, I tried to kill myself once. I tried to drown myself. Oh, yeah. Went to the beach. I don't know how since, I don't know how serious I was. Like, what a towel. <laughs> I love that. That joke has 38 layers to it. It's so deep. Yes. Yeah, I love that joke. Thing. And. And he did that on Carson, I think. Like, that's a suicide Carson sure. joke. And everybody's applauding. I mean, he was so different to me. He was so weird. Uh, I, yeah, I'm a, I was a big fan. Uh, I, I brought him up to Jerry once, and he was blown away that I knew him. But he's good. Yeah, well, he's got good jokes. You know, it, every joke was no, like he had great jokes. Yeah. Well, that was the thing. I mean, but there's so many, you know what I mean? But what he was, what he was lacking, just not to speak ill of the dead, was... I, I, even I'm going to say, if I'm watching him do an hour, at the end of 40 minutes, I'm like, okay, I could be reading a joke book. I want, to, I want uh, a little more of you. Right, right. Good point. I want Good a little point. more, you know, or even if a guy like that doesn't have to necessarily expose himself fully, but I want to see you work the crowd because he was so quick. Of a funny, he was a really quick guy. Obviously, he couldn't write those kind of jokes if he weren't. Yeah. But when he would just talk, his banter would make you laugh. So you like things to be a little mixed up sometimes, you know, a little bit different. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I mean, I, I, I've always, now we're getting real deep into comedy theory, but I think if you're going to be a one-liner guy, you have to have a huge persona. I mean, look at Stephen Wright, weirdo, monotone, yeah. balding, juggle neck, yeah. handsome, super dark, right. super confident, Hedberg, uh, you know, long hair, hippy-dippy, uh, druggy. You've right. got to have a huge persona because otherwise it can't yes. sustain for an hour. It's, too, it's just well, one line after the, another. What about the ultimate, Rodney? Just ah, funny. yes. Right. But here's the thing well, about Rodney. It was all personal. Yeah. Yes. And, but you felt it in your, you felt it, you felt his pain the whole time he was up there. Yes. Yes. You know? Exactly. So was, and, like those old school guys were kind of detached. Like Henny Young was like my wife. He had no emotions. Right. He had no feeling about his mother-in-law. He had no feeling about his wife. He had no feeling about her cooking being bad. Rodney, he <laughs> felt pain on every moment of every bit of it. You know. Right. <laughs> right. So true. Because, <laughs> we were talking about uh, how the great thing was, which went segways, you know, about yeah. about uh. Rodney, and how he's like, his segues were, were so funny because on the one hand, he's like, it ain't easy. It ain't easy for any, anything. You go to, you go to the coaches, so that ain't easy. So he's doing a segue that's really obvious. Like he's making fun of the segue at the same time, like a lot of times. Right, right. When Johnny Carson, he's like, it ain't it. Johnny, you know. You know it's not the, you know I don't have any luck with that. I have no luck. But at the same time, he's making fun of it. But at the same time, it's a segue that really is like the ultimate truth of what he's conveying, which is yes. it, it, easy. It's it's brutal, and that's right. What made it so when it, now the jokes still have to be great jokes. Yes. And the jokes when his jokes were not great, it sat there and bombed. <laughs> but all that stuff with a great joke, that's when you have a great act. You know that's why people oh. are excited. I mean, when I was when I was twenty and twenty one, twenty those early eighties, you know. Mm -hmm. Rodney was, there was nobody even close. I mean, and his movies yeah. were funny. Oh, yeah. You know, they weren't yeah. amazing, but they were funny. Those two I think he's one of the best of all time, but he, he kind of gets forgotten sometimes. I think because he's so goofy. You know, he's got the big eyes, the, the neck yes. twist, the neck tie, you know, adjusting. And, but that, to yeah. me, he was, it was, his body was like an instrument. He looked perfect. He sounded perfect. He dressed perfect. It's almost like That's he had cool. to just look in the mirror and go, not only am I going to write a great joke, but my body will become part of it. And, and yeah, he couldn't do jokes about agree. being, he couldn't do jokes about being confident because it would match. But yet he figured out a yeah, way to match. That's probably why it took so long to figure it out. 
Yeah, absolutely. And once in a while, he would joke that was like about, hey, you ever notice people, these idiots do this, and people are like, yeah, okay, it's a funny joke. But right. Just, no, because the core, that, and I feel like what made it sustainable all those years was because the abuse and the lack of respect that most people feel in life. Yes. You're not just laughing at Rodney. You're laughing at life and going, yeah, no respect. Yes. And That's I forget, my life. One time somebody, yeah, yeah. One time there was an, uh, an article or something about him. You know how he was a salesman. He tried to stand up and he was like, you know, Lenny Bruce, kind of hip, pot smoking guy. You know, he was part of that whole crew, Jack Roy. Yeah. And then what, he went away, went back into aluminum sales and at 38 or 39. I forget what he said, but something just hit him, but no respect, and then that was it. Mm. Interesting. There you go. And I think, yeah, it's interesting because that guy that was friends with him and Lenny Bruce, I guess inspiration was the guy that Lenny Bruce stole his persona from, kind of. And he yeah. lived with Rodney for like 20 years. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Did you, did you read the book, The Comedian? <laughs> did you read no, uh, The Cliff? The Cliff Nesteroff book, it's called The Comedians, uh, Scoundrels, uh, whatever, whatever, and Pickpockets. I no. don't know. It's, 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 oh, it's amazing. It's, it's so good. It's like up there, I think it's some of the best comedy books, but the Rodney section, oh, wow. he basically just takes all the people who are the most influential prior, Carl and Rodney, and, and so on, and it starts in vaudeville, and the end of the book ends in podcasting. And he just, he just dissects wow. every, he got radio, he does TV, then he does the coffee shops, two comedy clubs. Um, what? But it's, the Rodney section's amazing. He was wildly depressed. Nobody liked hanging out with him because he was, he was only Nick Griffin. Like, he was just a, a drip, you know? <laughs> and, you know, like, he was a huge pothead. And he talked about getting molested as a kid tons of times. And oh. uh, he grew up in Queens, and his mom wouldn't talk to him, and his dad walked out. It was, it's fascinating because you, you just see, like, oh, this is the blueprints for all the no respect. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. Wait, sorry, I got oh, so excited. Another there. great example. By the way, who's funnier than Nick Griffin? The only thing you like about Nick Griffin, too, I always say this, but here's a guy that when he goes on stage, even in New York, yeah. people that consider themselves, you know, in an existential crisis and bleak, and they're like, oh, my God, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's how... That's how hardcore he is and hilarious as we both know but but i'm saying that's how hardcore funny he is right but yeah. i always say this son of a bitch spent 20 years on bob and tom going to these midwestern places where people are trying to keep a you know a positive outlook and yeah. this guy walks in <laughs> it must have been the funniest thing of all time <laughs> <laughs> yeah right I, mean, I would love to see him i would love to see him you know like in Omaha or at Penguins or, you know, totally. somewhere in the, in a real Midwestern thing, walking on stage and be like, oh, we're up for a good time. This guy's from, he's just on the, you know, Kansas City. He's yeah. from, you know, the heartland. And just watch him go up there and just be himself. That would be really fun to see, you know. That's so true. I mean, he's, he's one of the best writers in New York. And uh, to yeah. be, to be that entertaining while being that much of a bummer. Like, I remember David Tell. Bummer. Said, David Tell one time said, uh, when Nick Griffin kept talking, David Tell goes, can someone open a window and let the sad out? And it was the perfect, <laughs> perfect line. Right. But he's he's brilliant. I mean, he's owning that. Of course. It's thick and it's real and it's it's genuine. And he writes around that. He's not writing about chip or shit. It's, uh, it's, it's been. No. He writes and it's perfect. Well, what I would like to do someday, now you just give me an idea what I would like to do. I would uh, like to direct comedy specials. So direct Nick Griffin in his hometown. Direct ooh. you in New Orleans. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And just because it's going to bring another thing. And, you know, you go there for like a month beforehand and work on your material only in New Orleans. So it brings flashes back of all the oh, of childhood. Wow. And then just have people go up there and do their thing because... Everybody in that town will understand what you're saying in a way nobody else. And, you know, people are like, oh, it gets too, like, inside. No. They say in the specific is the universal. That's one of my favorite right. books, William Goldman, that screenwriter. In the Ooh. specific is universal. So if you're talking about New Orleans, first of all, not people in New Orleans. It's not even yeah. a fair example. But it's also, if you're talking 
people now can just Google information, go, what is he talking about? What restaurant? But, and then right. they read the Reddit thread. They look at the Reddit thread and go, oh, <laughs> these people said that's exactly the way it happens over there. Oh, my God. You know what I mean? Like this. Yeah. It doesn't have to be this instantaneous, like, ha, ha. Those are, we've done that. Everybody's proven in comedy. Yeah. You know, most people that do this know how to go on stage, kill, and leave. But now we're talking yeah. something else. You know what I mean? And yeah, it's, 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 not the, it's not a radical thing, but right. It's just kind of something, something interesting to just add a little something to it, a little more, you know. It's, because, also, interesting. it's also interesting. A lot of comics are running away from that childhood and that past, and it would, have, it would force yeah. their face a little bit. I don't, I don't like doing shows in New Orleans. It sucks. My high school buddies come out. They call me a homo. They heckle. And you go, oh, this is why I left. Yeah. You fucking idiot. But, yeah, yeah well, I mean. How do you think I feel? Uh, <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to have my whole life at my shows every night for the first 15, 20 years. Oh, nightmare. Everybody nightmare. I knew came to every, yeah, but then you take anything else. You get used to it. And someone's yeah. going to see your bomb, and they're never going to think you're funny. You know what I mean? Like, right. And it's just, oh. I mean, they all saw me from the beginning. So they really yeah. got people. I mean, you know, they Ooh. come up to you like, yeah, you weren't funny, but now you're funny. You know, so it's like, yeah, they watched the whole thing. So, you know, it, but it would just be interesting to do, you know, like you and the yeah. Orleans, it would bring back your act. It would, it only, it would only help. You I know, guess so. Just I, I, yeah, I have no desire to do it, but. But, uh, I no, dude, what that's saying. what I mean. But we even talk about that. We go, I have no desire to do this. I don't want to do this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, right. You can say there's people in that place, there's people up front that the reason I worked so hard was to never see that person again. And now I invited them to my show. Right. They're literally <laughs> hey. here. And Ugh. I know they're going to be hoping for the worst for me. I'm um, just, you know, just, just thinking about it. Yeah, it would be great. <laughs> Plus, I mean... Every comedy thing has to have a hook now, and that's a pretty good hook. You know, Gary Goldman's a brilliant writer, but we have to have his depression in there, you know? like and, So this is a good way to, right. to sell something, because it, it brings their whole past and childhood back. Well, it's not just about selling. It's about, it's about showing people comedy. You know, I mean, the special. Back to that for a second. It just shows a little other side. So when you're watching the actual stand-up, you're watching it with a little... Uh, like, if you're watching a movie, right? Uh, and if you're watching, if you're watching, if you're watching, if you're watching Goodfellas, right? Mm -hmm. And Goodfellas starts, or let's say Taxi Driver. You watch your Taxi Driver, and it starts with Travis Bickle's head shaved. You're yes. like, get this asshole off the screen. I don't want to see this psycho. <laughs> What's he doing? But when you're watching him trying to be normal, trying to live his life, he was in the Marines, and trying, uh -huh. to, yeah, trying to go out with a girl, he had normal yeah. hair. Yeah. Then you're like, okay, at least I know it gives context. So the comedy special don't where people ah. backstage and it's COVID gives you a little context. So these specials would be even more context. Right. Because now you're saying, oh, Mark's saying, look, I have no desire to be here. I want to tell you this is a mistake. I'm, I'm regretting this right now. So when people are watching you do stand-up, they're not just watching going, oh, what a great joke. They're going, right. oh, I thought I saw a little twitch. And they're identifying with the character, you. Doing your yes, own. it's like when you're watching a movie, only it's a real person. You got a lot. This is this is big. I think you got something here. This is brilliant. Yeah. So, the, the more yeah. you dig into it, the more I realize because that's why we like documentaries or or, or biographies. Yes, yeah. I watched the yeah. Beatles documentary. I didn't even know they had the worst fucking childhood on the planet. Nobody talks about. It. You think of them these cute mop top fab four, you know, yeah. little British kids. Their fucking dad died in the mill, and they had to take care of their mom when they were 11. They grew up yeah. poor in a factory town. I had no idea. Yeah, Liverpool, right? Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And instead of, it's, and, it's, and it made, it makes John and Paul, I'm, I'm also always interested in John and Paul, like that whole relationship, like what it meant, first of all, to be that famous at that time, yeah. and what, how that changes them. But also, the fact that, Paul was, people don't realize this. Yes, John was a genius. Paul was brilliant. But John was you know, a genius in a certain way. And, but the fact that Paul loved John, in my opinion, and John uh, hated Paul. Hated him. Hated him. <laughs> hated him. <laughs> God, and Paul <laughs> loved John. Yeah. Well, loved him. He had a horrible temper. He was terrifying. Uh, it's like anything, you know, like Louis C.K. would always, they said Jimmy Fallon tried to write for his, his show when it was 
Right. Uh, what was that? What was that show? The early show, and he was like, "No, I hate this kid. He's cute. I don't want anybody attractive right. around me." And I feel like it's the same thing with right. Paul. The Paul was too uh, cute. Yeah, he was you know cute. What? Everybody liked him. He was bubbly, and then John's this brooding, you know, tortured, you know, guy, and he's hitting, yeah. he's hitting Yoko. Uh, I think uh, you know, but oh yeah, he's hitting them all. But you know yeah. what? You're right. And, 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 but here's what's so funny. What you're saying because I would say I was trying to bring it back to like, oh, they're different ways of reacting to their Liverpool uh, childhood. Right. But you're right. Oh, I see. Sometimes it comes down as simply as jealousy because this guy's good looking. Of course, <laughs> completely. Yeah, I mean, we're human, no human nature. I know, but I'm just saying, I was like trying to be like, yeah, you, know, you wonder how people react. And you're like, right. oh, it's just because he's been looking. And you're right, you're probably 100% right. It was just oh. because he had bigger eyes. Yeah. And girls were like, oh my God. Right, right. Yeah. But no, you, it's a good point. You're right. It's so true that they're both in the same place and they both took these left and right turn personality wise. But I yeah, but, you, but the, you're right, but it's because of. But it would say anatomy is destiny. It was probably because of the looks. I think so. Yeah, <laughs> if, you're, if you were six four, you'd be a different guy. Oh yeah, of course. My dream was to be. It's funny you should mention that because when I was growing up, people asked me when I was in Washington, I would be six eight, two forty. That was my oh, dream. Geez. Because Connie Hawkins was six eight. He was one ninety probably, but he was a basketball yeah. player. And they used to read his book, and I said, I just want to be a pro basketball player. And when I look back even now at my game and the way of what it was, part of it was because I was meant to be a forward moving sideline. If you watch basketball at all, they don't even have them uh, anymore. This kind of right. small forward they used to go. And I was yeah. too small to even be a guard, really. And mm-hmm. so that's one of the uh, one of the mistakes that God made in my life. Yeah, but six eight, that's a little that's a little much, don't you oh, think? Give I me mean, a break. Hey, Tim Bad and Brad Gary, great. give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> then Ben Brad Garrett six nine. No, that's I'm that's I'm yeah. not Sinbad. Bad. I think he's probably six five, maybe. Six nine. What? Sinbad pl- Sin played the University of Denver at Colorado or University of Colorado at Denver, I don't know. But he played wow. on a pretty legitimate college team. Holy hell, I didn't know that. I mean Brad Garrett, look at I don't know. Conan's six six. Oh, I don't think he was taller than two that, but I'll, I'll give it a goog. Conan's probably six six, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna bet That's right now. Point. Well, well, then you should be a little more informed. You should have had. <laughs> you shouldn't have had that unsure. You shouldn't have had that unsure attitude when you went Sinbad's height. You're like, I'm looking for him. Ah, maybe six five. Yeah, I didn't think I'm maybe six six. I didn't feel I didn't get a six nine vibe. My roommate in college was six nine. He was a he was a mountain of a man. I didn't I never he was put thin battle. Yeah, he was a huge guy from Tennessee, big doughy white guy. But, oh my god, uh, what college? Wait, let me guess what college. Wait, yeah, I'm gonna guess. Ready? She said from Tennessee, so it wasn't Vanderbilt, like our good friend uh, Nate Bergassi. Um, no. By the way, speaking of cornering a market, that son of a bitch is the best. Ooh, but even he's getting man. killed by this thing right now. But what he about um? Killed. All right, so he was untapped. We went to college. That was an untapped market. Was that? Somebody had to fill. I knew exactly where you went to college. All right, hit me. LSU. Wow, nailed it on the head. Really? Yeah, yeah. I lived in a house with five guys. I, I failed out of three colleges because I was such a drunk. But uh. Yeah, I ended up finishing there, and I moved to New York with one year left, and I finished online in an apartment in Crown Heights. Oh. First yeah. of all, Pete Maravich is the greatest person in American history. Pistol Pete. You don't know how – I know I watch YouTube of him. I, I watch it all the time. Yeah, he's the great white hope, but why isn't he bigger? Why is, where's the documentary on him? What do you mean? They had, they had documentaries on him I'm back in the 90s. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm talking, what, did it come on PBS? I need, I need a real <laughs> no, production here. Stuff on no, oh, okay. oh, you mean like a 30? They even had a 30 for 30 on, I think. Oh, okay. Well, I'll watch that tonight. I'm, I'm a huge 30 for 30 yeah, guy. Sounds to me like you're really not a, you're, you're not a loyal LSU uh, Tiger. Right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was there for the Nick Saban years, buddy. Oh, that's right. It was like and a Coliseum. Was Marshall Henderson there with two or two? Uh, no. I don't know. That doesn't ring a bell. No, I think he went to Mississippi. Anyway, that's so funny. 
All right. Yeah, anyway, we're we're going off the rails here. Oh, oh, oh let me yeah, we we'll wrap up. We'll wrap up soon. I'm keeping you here, but uh, can I just ask about Brooklyn? The alumni yeah. of Brooklyn is bananas, uh, and I don't know if it's just yes. if it's a huge. It's a huge bro. It's a giant. Or is it the melting pot bullshit? Is it the immigrant thing? Uh, it's just, you know, Chris Rock, it's you. Seinfeld was born in Brooklyn. Beastie Boys. Uh, Bobby Fischer. Uh, the guy who invented uh, Jonah Salk. I mean, it just it goes on and on. The guy who invented what? The polio vaccine. Oh, Jonah Salk, yeah. yeah. Mike Tyson. Woody Allen. Allen uh, Larry Davis. Mike Lee. Mike Lee, Davis. yeah. Everybody. And... Just Harvey Keitel, Marissa Tomei, uh, just goes mm. on and on. It's bananas. It is crazy. It is crazy. I'm going to keep Mel Brooks. Yes. Uh, Neil Diamond, Barbara Streisand. Oh, you my know. God. Neil Diamond, the Jewish Once you go into the Jews, then you go really... If you go into the Jews of Brooklyn, then you go really deep. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah. Adam Sandler was born there. Everybody. That's right. Well, I think Jimmy what Kimmel is it about Brooklyn? I feel like it's... I feel like um, Brooklyn and uh, the Bronx to a lesser extent, the Bronx, but Brooklyn is one of those places that it was, it was just the perfect combination. Like you said, melting pot combined with being so full of people. I tell people once I go, junior high school, I peaked, and anybody that grew up with me knows that. Like, <laughs> whatever, I was never funnier than when I was yes. 13 and 14, and anybody that knew me at that age knows I'm not making it up. I was on fire wow. for two years. I've been down ever since. You know That's what that is? I think a lot of comics, because I was, I was the same way, maybe ninth grade, tenth grade. It's, yeah. it's the un, You're so uncomfortable as a human being in your own skin, with your family, trying to be cool, trying to be fit in, be accepted. I think that uncomfortability makes you, it's almost like when you're bombing, but you're bombing in life, and so you're just pulling right. out of your ass. Oh, yes. That's part of it. But the other part is the stimuli around you. I mean, I gather from you, same like me, when you grow up in a multicultural area where everything's mm -hmm. black, white, Puerto Rican, everything, you yeah. have more. And in those days, when I grew up, of course, there was people who said politically correct. People would go, why are you, what do you even mean by that? We're trying to, we're identifying that person. But right. you're going to pretend you don't see that person as they really are. It was just the opposite. That was depersonalization. You yes. Know, political correctness was depersonalization. Completely. Completely. You know? That's a great so, way. That's a great T-shirt. So the um, so that also helps, you know. And I, you yeah. know, I said it in my other book, but there was a. This is how funny everybody was. I just, I might have told you this, but it's in my book, my other book, color book. And it, I got the kid Mark Williams. What? And mm -hmm. Mark Tishy screamed at us one day. She was, she was scary. And she was in class and dead quiet. Miss Ferrara, we were all dead quiet in class. Mm -hmm. And at the end of school, the bell rings. She goes, "Don't anybody move." More like, oh boy, she's really had it this time, you know. And yeah. then Mark Williams was from another class. He opens the door to school's right now. He goes to a kid, another kid, Godfrey in the class, another black kid. He goes, Godfrey, your father says leave the shoes on the back steps. You've got to go to work. And shuts the door and walks, leaves. The, the, even Miss Laura <laughs> is crying with laughter. Because he didn't deliver it. He didn't deliver it trying to get a laugh. He delivered yeah. it and shut the door and left. Oh, like there's one pair wow. of shoes in the family, so yeah. leave them on the back. <laughs> I mean, and can you imagine? And it, it's, oh, sorry, that, that, that's so funny. <laughs> and oh man, that, and the, the tension was built because she said, "Be quiet." So he already had the setup. Yeah, she was. You never saw her like that. She was going crazy. She was out of whatever we were doing, and yeah. then this guy just leans in, probably nodded at her, if I remember correctly. Like, sorry, this is a message, an official message from. And he goes, "God for you, Father says." Leave the shoes in the back steps of the school. He's got to go to work. And shuts the door and leaves. So That's nobody amazing. Leaves. By the time we register what he said, he's already the door shut. He's gone. Ah. Uh, did he get to hear the well, laugh? Shit that just happened all the time. People would just make it out. Every joke was, was delivered like, not every joke, but enough people had that sense of humor delivering yeah. straight-faced information that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't dumb. It was really funny. Wow, that's that's I can see that so perfectly. Did did he know that was funny, or was he just being straight? No, he knew it was funny. Oh, of that's amazing! He, I mean, there's, there's no back. The father didn't come with shoes in the back steps of school. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! I mean, you know, he was just making a joke. 
He was just saying, uh, okay. <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah. Like your shoes in your family. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow! It's so funny. It's so brilliant. I can't even. I can't even believe it. But like, that's so that. it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. Even in uh, in in New York Story, people always quote this line. Of course, it drives me crazy. It, it's because you know people always quote the one joke you didn't come up with. Oh, you know, I hate you do an hour. Brutal. Brutal. Yeah, it happens a lot. So yeah. people quote this line, which was given to a kid more who was a power professional, and it was said from one kid to another when he was teaching in school in Brooklyn, and the kid goes, they're, they're attacking each other, and he goes, shut up, Ali, you live in the back of a hallway, I saw a common school smelling like cookies. <laughs> and oh, man. So, so that's the line, a lot of people quote that line, and it was, of course, Jim, he told me somebody said that. You know right, I mean? right. So oh. it was so funny to me, because, you know, it's the one line, you're like, it was quite not that line, but yeah, I didn't write that. <laughs> ah, but it's so true, Ringo. I mean, I went to public school. You know, it's a ton of black kids. Yeah. They, they, yeah, there's no one funnier. There's no one more loud. There's no one more aggressive with everybody, and it's just oh, you had to step it yes. up. Yes, you had to step it up exactly. That's why yeah. when you were probably like me, you were probably you wanted a badge of pride. But when you walked into school, everybody knew this guy's funny too. Don't oh. don't sleep on him. Okay. Completely, completely. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yes. Uh, I, I still remember Same every thing. funny every funny line I had that got like a room laugh. I still remember them all, which is so <laughs> sad. But I was fourteen, but I remember. <laughs> I them. love it. I love it. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, okay, but oh, to bring it full circle, the cut key, not the cut keys, but the the back porch with the shoes guy. That guy might yeah. struggle on stage because what, what's he going to do? Walk in and go, "Hey, everybody! Uh, hey, this guy." Well, put sure. His no, that's a whole. I mean, that's the other thing about it. Is once. You know how many guys, when I, well, I'm sure you said the same thing, they start comedy, they're so funny, and they show up and they're like, oh no, this is, this is a yeah. different, I got to use this, I got to take the joy out of it. Yeah, to a certain exactly. Extent. Exactly. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, yeah. we have joy now when we do it, but the joy of spontaneity and you have to really, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. a different thing, you know what I mean? It is. It, yeah. it makes you less funny. But again, that's also why it's so great because you comedy, stand up comedy, mostly homework. It's a lot of homework, a lot of rewriting, a lot of writing, a lot of listening to stuff. Yeah. yeah. And most people don't want to deal with that. Good. Fuck them. Let let us do it, and we can be the comics. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's so many people that that are. Uh, like you, I mean, how many people? You know, I mean, I was talking about my friend Al. He worked in the ambulance corps. So he had a job that every day he'd come home with a story from an eight-hour mm-hmm. shift in the ambulance. You can have an interesting story. Sure. This guy would gather, we would gather for him to come and tell us his <laughs> story of the yeah. ambulance. And he was, he was personally hilarious anyway. Really right. funny guy. Every day he would tell us his story. <laughs> and we didn't know the ambulance people. It was the funniest He'd be peppering it with insults to everybody there and what they did. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, he was just a master. He never became a stand-up, but his stories were these 20 to 30-minute epic, brilliant stories mm. off the top of his head that happened that day. And it was, uh, the way he told them was so funny. And he's like, so then Al, he talked to himself in the third, Al decides he's going to be nice and help this person. <laughs> <laughs> and what did they do? What did they do, Carl? They bit Al. Uh, they bit Al's finger. Oh, Al's wow. finger got bit by somebody trying to help. They uh, think it's funny. But guess what, asshole? The day's going to come when you're... And he just going to... I mean, he was just... Oh, wow. Now, and everybody knew it. It wasn't just me. Thing. People were doubled over laughing. Oh, it's amazing. Two things about that guy. One... Can you imagine if YouTube and podcasting was around? I mean, this guy would have, he'd be huge on yes. TikTok. Just tell these stories. He'd yes. make a million dollars. And then, not two, TikTok, he'd be a podcast. He was a yeah, podcast. He was the world. He'd be he was amazing. Yeah, he was but, really, really fun. Do you think he was nervous? Like, oh man, I'm really building a name for myself here. Uh, my last story killed. Uh, I kind of got nothing this week. Like, do you think he would have to really prepare? Or is he just that good? No, because he was one of those really, he was one of those funny guys. And he wasn't prepared because he's coming right out of the ship. But he was one of those guys that if he wasn't getting laughs, 
he was re- real funny and he'd be like he wouldn't be like oh I bombed he'd be like fuck you I'm not here to fucking entertain you you know what I mean like uh, <laughs> yeah so it wasn't it wasn't a kind of pressure for him because he's like right. what do I give a shit you know because it was still yeah. his life so <laughs> wow oh um, god yeah Oh, yeah, we, we used to live in this horrible neighborhood, and our house was like a real money pit. So we'd have all these guys work on the house, and these are like blue-collar, never finished high school, you know, barely know how to use a hammer, but they need the money kind of guys. And I would just <laughs> sit down and listen to them bullshit as like an eight-year-old, right. you know, and it's like they're smoking, <laughs> and they're talking about like getting prostitutes and all that, and they're, they're hitting like a like a little vodka <laughs> bottle in their pocket. And it was, it was the best time of my life. My parents were like, don't sit with them. What are you crazy? Because I come in going, oh, he's, he's fucking whatever. And I see it mimic the language. But man, those guys yeah. are stories. Well, that's so funny. I told you about the time I went to New Orleans. I, that's one of my books, too. Where I go to Louisiana, and the guy picks me up. I go outside the airport. My first time in New Orleans, 400 pounds, fat, fat guy. Uh-huh. You get a station wagon. You need a cab? I go, yeah. Get in the cab. Big fat white dude. We start driving. He might have been like a, a what do you call us? What did you guys say? Creole or whatever. But, uh, oh, yeah. Or a Cajun. He might have been a Cajun Creole. But anyway, we're driving. And he makes me, he goes, sit on over here. He opens the front door. I have to sit next to him in the front. So uh-huh. my foot is against his foot. He goes, why are you messing my foot for? I go, what? He goes, why are you messing my foot for? I go, well, <laughs> the baby sit up front. We pull it because I got to get gas. This is 10.30 <laughs> in the morning. I got to get gas. He goes, oh. all right. And he, he goes, come on, you, uh, you pump it, you know. I go, what? Yeah. He goes, you pump it. I'm going, I'm going to go pay. I have to pump the gas. <laughs> which is a takeaway. I mean, he goes, yeah. he comes out with a six-pack of beer, opens the can, starts drinking, offers me one, I just, and he starts uh, drinking to be at 10.30 in the morning, driving me. Yeah. I swear yeah. to God, that's all exactly the way it went down. That sounds uh, about right. I mean, I remember being a kid getting in a cab with the guy would have a beer between his legs, you know. And then, you know, you have friends, you have friends come visit, and they would go like, oh, shit, man, you better put the beer away. You know, some guy from Boston would come, and he'd be like, put the beer away. And the guy's like, what? The cop would go, Woo, just whiz by. You know, you had bigger fish to fry. You couldn't believe it. Yeah. It's like jaywalking yeah. in New York, you know? You can jaywalk in New York right from the cop, nobody likes the kid. Exactly, exactly. Perfect analogy. But, uh, yeah, all right. Boy, we can go on and on, but uh, we got things to do. You probably got to yeah. do another Chris Millhouse podcast. I don't want to keep you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. I have to three more there. <laughs> oh, jeez, that's brutal. At least the podcast is great. Do you feel like you're doing something, even though you're just sitting at home? No, I disagree. I'm, I mean, I just, I can't take podcasts. I can't take it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how you guys do it. You spend your whole lives having these conversations. It's draining to me. It's draining, but it, is, it does become a skill. You get good at it and uh, you get, you know, you, you start to polish your stories and you figure out your voice or whatever the hell it is. Yeah. Just like stuff. It's an art and it yeah. pays well. And it, does it help you with stand up or hurt you? Oh, it helps. Well, it helps. First of all, it helps sell tickets like a like you wouldn't believe. And then secondly, it that's you good. come up with bits because you're talking so much. You're like, oh, that's something, and you that's write good. that down. Now you got a bit. So that's it great. helps in a, in a little way, but it is exhausting. Yeah. Oh yeah. Plus, right, everybody has to each other's podcast. The exhausting yeah. part is not doing your po- is not you doing your podcast. It's that you have to get your friends to do it, then you have to go do theirs. Yes. Yes, exactly. But if they have a fan base, it's now you get some of that, verbal, they get some of yours. It's a verbal crossover. Pyramid, pyramid scheme. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And look <laughs> at these L.A. guys. They're millionaires. They all do each other. Bobby Lee does Theo Vaughn, who does Brenton Schaub, who does Joe Rogan, who does Tom Segura. I mean, yeah. it's incestual, but they they make millions. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's it, man. Yeah, well, nobody's having real conversations anymore. And also, I think comedy is is almost like a novelty now. Like stand up is so it's so rote and so less stimulus. It's so little stimulus that I think people need that pot because you can put it in your ear and you do the dishes. Right, right. Yeah, 